Well, let's go from still alive. Speaking of still alive, Monday Night Raw still on the air. That's all they got. There was a, at least a, a segment or two that were interesting, and there was lots of other stuff on another fine, mediocre edition of Monday Night Raw. And we won't, uh, I don't think this will take long. There were just a couple of things, but it goes from a four hour car wreck in AEW to three hours of people talking to you in an insincere manner the following day on Raw. These things couldn't be too too much farther apart. They're polar opposites. The, the yin and the yang, as they say. Which one do you think is yin and which one's yang? Oh, I don't know. Which one out of the people in the first segment, or which one? I don't even know what the question is. No, I'm the well. The question is: AEW Yang and oh. WWE is Yang, or or vice which? Because if they're two completely opposite things, one of them's got to be the Yangers, and one of them's got to be the Yangers. I'm trying to think of some joke that would work in here, and there's nothing. Well, and, and that's your that fault, works. not mine. I served it up for you. <laughs> you you fucking whiffed it. So raw <laughs> on May 29th was. Because you don't know how to pitch. Well, hey, I, I, boy, I tell you what. I was flipping by the channels the other day, as they say, and I saw the women's softball. And the, the, I, apparently it was a tournament of some kind, and that's the real good teams, and you ought to see them pitch. I don't care if they hit. I don't care if they run. I'm fascinated by them. They pitch underhanded to where <laughs> it would goddamn kill you yeah. If it contacted you. Have you ever seen this? Oh, of course. Yeah, I've hit it off it. Yeah. What? I refuse to believe you can hit one of these fucking hot shot women throwing well, that underhanded fucking cartwheel and God, they look like they just throw their arm right out with it. I've hit off fast pitch softball. I've not hit off one of these collegiate female athletes throwing it the way they do. Well, goddamn, when I played softball with Mama Cornette out in the backyard, if I'd have thrown something at her like that, she'd have hit me with the bat. You guys played softball, just two people? Well, that's all we had. The dog couldn't do much for us. You used the softball, though, like an actual regulation-sized softball? Yeah. She pitched it and you would hit it? Or vice versa. You pitched it to her and she hit? Yeah, she was a better hitter than I was, but we had to... We had to can it on the baseball. The baseball was first, but I accidentally one time actually hit a good one, and it was a line drive right at her, and she hopped up like a whooping crane on one <laughs> leg, and it went under her, and she, she started getting five feet farther back and went to a softball. But anyway, I digress. So speaking of softballs, Raw started... With Seth Franklin Rollins, the new world heavyweight champion number three, coming to the ring through the people. And I'm thinking, okay, what must Plummer Moxley think sitting there watching this? Roman Reigns, his old stable mate, is the biggest star in wrestling. I wish I had a pack of Twinkies. <laughs> besides that. Roman Reigns is Doritos the biggest star in wrestling. Doritos besides that. Doritos too, okay. Biggest star in wrestling, Seth Franklin Rollins doing his enter through the crowd gimmick. Even though it's the third world title, he's still a world champion in the biggest company. And there's the plumber cutting his head on indie shows and playing tough guy on cable. He's got to be basic cable. And basic cable. You got that going for you. Yeah. So <laughs> it's badass. With the singing and the you deserve it chant, so he deserves the number three world title in the company. And the slow pace promo, it, it was about 10 minutes into the show when AJ came out. And they go, okay, business, as they say, is about to pick up. And it turns out AJ came out to say congratulations to him and they shook hands. So okay, I'm thinking, well, this is the most non-confrontational opening Raw segment I've ever seen. But then here comes... The Judgment Day, because now we're 15 minutes in to this segment. And they came out, and, and again, they, they have them come out and say, we run Raw and pretty much every week, and each one of them gets a chance to say something, and we like everybody in the, in the group. Even Finn grows on us. Priest is doing great. But basically, it, it's a challenge for a match later on. We couldn't have seen that coming on Monday Night Raw. 
And it was 20 minutes in by the time that it was over. And then I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. It, it, there's the matter of the draft and that AJ's not supposed to be here. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. But then they come back and Adam Pierce is on the phone saying, okay, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And he okays the tag match for later, even though AJ's on SmackDown, he can be on Raw. And by yes, sir, one would think, because we've also heard reported it was a Vince McMahon call. So Vince called him and said, nah, put AJ on the show and blew up their draft in two weeks. Or has it been three now? I think it's been definitely more than two, maybe a month. No, it's been three weeks, because remember the new rosters took effect on May the 8th. Oh, that's right. That's right. Good point. So... All right. You know, it's like I try to, I try, I want to give Rollins a chance and I can't because I hate him. And I don't, I mean, I don't hate him as a human being. I hate whatever the made up character is that has no real definable traits. Like he calls himself a visionary and I'm like, what's the vision? What is the vision? I don't understand. In what way are you a visionary? So I don't. Dig Rollins, but I try to think like, okay, if I was if, a kid, if he was a visionary, then he ought to beat everybody by seeing what kind of finishing move they're going to do ahead of time and moving out of the way of it. And I watch this and I think, okay, well, I've seen this guy for a long time now. And I saw what he used to be. I saw what he was before WWE, in developmental, after developmental. And then when all else failed, he became this. So it's hard for me to give this a chance because it's ridiculous. It's a guy, it's a kid at home acting like what a wrestler would be if he could be a wrestler. And I don't like that. But and I try to think, is, what are those, what are the fans who are just discovering it think? Do they think, because they've never seen Tyler Black or other versions of Seth Rollins, do they think, yeah, this wild and crazy guy is <laughs> really cool. Like, I try to look at it from the other perspective, but to me, it's just so manufactured and lame. That's what I, if you're looking for wild and crazy, old Juice Robinson may fit wild and crazy. This is kind of over the top and silly. And, and I'm a, I'm a fan. He can still go in the ring. It's not like he's trying yeah. to do this to cover up that he's lost something or whatever. And I've always liked his work. And, and if he can, if he can say all these things, he could talk as a serious human being. And when he gets serious in any of these things, whether it's the sit-down interview or even when he stuck his hand out to shake AJ's hand, I like that. I believe in that. But otherwise, it just becomes a guy who always had the in-ring, always had the potential, outside of the shield, to me, seemed to have a difficult time to really establish his personality so that people would invest in it. So then he just manufactured a completely fake personality to go out there and do this stuff he's a good looking guy he could just stand there and be handsome rather than silly i don't know the judgment the judgment day stuff because this is not the first week where we've seen a confrontation of sorts with the judgment day in like the opening segment or i think yeah typically it's the opening segment yeah i enjoy them and you know it doesn't sound like they're going away anytime soon and they always know they can go to dominic whenever they just want a big reaction <laughs> because when they were saying you know, I may win the world title, or maybe this guy will win the world title. Oh, maybe Dom Dom! And the place yeah. just... The idea, yeah. the audacity of saying the this aud guy's going to win the world title. The gall of you. <laughs> uh, and that, again, you know, love the Judgment Day, but this is a formula. And, and I know they're, they're going to defend it by saying, well, we're structuring the story elements to have a flowing through the show and start it, and they'll know what the main event is. But just... <laughs> Change up the way shit happens. Uh, Money in the Bank qualifier. It's almost that time again where people climb ladders to retrieve aluminum briefcases. And uh, Ricochet beat The Miz. Surprise, surprise. That was about all I can say about that. Do you have any comments? This was a fast forward heavy show for me. I'm not watching them live anymore because <laughs> I've learned my lesson. You just get so many commercials. And actually on this show, it felt like they had to jam a few in real quick to make up for that long opening segment. So with a lot of commercials early on, I knew this yeah. would be quick. I kind of thought I knew who would win. And I knew there were other things that were priorities for me with my time. I wanted to see what was going to happen with Cody. wanted to see what was going to happen with Trish and Becky. If anything else grabs me while I'm fast-forwarding, I'll stop. But otherwise, I kind of knew what I wanted to focus my time on. 
We're moving along. And Trish, as you just mentioned, got an in-ring promo, and the crowd audio was jacked up practically until you could hear their heartbeats <laughs> at the first of it. And then the what's started, and, and they brought it back down. And she brought out Zoe Stark, who was the young lady who interfered in the match with her and Becky at the, the big event over in Arabia. And she's from NXT. We haven't seen, you know, her, that was her debut on the main roster, right? So we haven't seen her on a program yet. Interesting look. She's got no hair on one side of her head and only one sleeve on her jacket. So it it had me off balance there for a little bit. But the problem is the people wanted her to. And see, Trish was being a catty, bitchy, kind of low-key heel. And she was delivering the material okay. But it's easy for the crowd, if they want to, to hijack that because she's soft-spoken and she's doing the material that she's prepared and they're just wanting her. Well, with Zoe Stark, now she's the first time she's ever talked on live Monday Night Raw and the people are wanting her and she got lost and had to just stand there for a minute. She put the microphone down and I, I couldn't, I jacked my audio up. I couldn't hear exactly what she said, but she asked Becky or Trish in some form, what the fuck do I do? And and Trish said something, and she got back on the mic at that, but at that point, here came Becky. And she wanted to restart their match with uh, Trish from the, the big event. And so Becky dumped Zoe with two moves on the floor and then got on Trish, but Zoe came from behind, and the heels got some heat. And Zoe tried to give Becky... I guess it's going to be her finish, but she gave it to her kind of, and then fell down and then Trish punched Becky in the face. And then they held her in the corner and tr it looked like they were trying to figure out how to either unfold the t-shirt, put the t-shirt on Becky um, nobody was trying to help. There were no referees. There was no friends of friends of Lynch involved. So they were just in the corner trying to, in an awkward way, put the Trish, thank you, Trish shirt on Becky in some fashion. And finally, they just set it on her chest. And that's what I got out of that. What'd you see? There were moments that were all right. Like Trish, again, she's soft-spoken, so it's hard no matter what she says, it's different than anyone out there on the mic in front of the live crowd yelling or raising their voice. She doesn't do that. And I'm not, I'm not saying that everybody should yell and she should be out there yelling and screaming, but it was, the problem is when they ain't interested. That's right. It's easy to fucking get over you. And obviously Zoe Stark got rattled because it was awkward, that moment where she just stands there and you're like, okay, what's happening? And then, you know, things continue. It was a silent there for that second as it was for that cold Jericho match. <laughs> you know, Becky is over still. She's still wearing her Kill Bill outfit. I want to give this a chance, but this kind of just, I don't know. It fell off. Well, the, and it didn't even fall off the rails. There were no rails. It just, it, it was kind of there on the show. The fact that the fans didn't give a shit about it after everything was pretty telling though. And that, you know, I love the match, but and and these people uh, didn't particularly want to hear this, but also it, it, their verbalism is not their specialty. You know what the other thing these is? La these ladies make their money with their muscles, not their mouths. The other thing is, too, that everyone operates under the assumption that the entire WWE fan base, newer fans and older fans, consider Trish Stratus at the level of a, you know, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a returning great from that, like an edge, I guess. Like, that's level of star coming back to do things. I think in the past she was really good. There's been hits and misses so far since she's been back a limited time, but I've liked her heel stuff. But they don't treat her like one of the legends returning. They treat her just like another woman on the roster. 
And I think that's also, you know, that's why I always think it's, you know, I hate to say it, but it would be better for there to be a concentrated women's wrestling show by WWE one, just their women. And build that audience so that audience will react to the things they want to see because I think it's been disappointing the reaction that Trish has gotten since she has returned. And, uh, you know, that um, when we were saying a couple of years ago, well, could they bring back some of the female legends of the past? And I'm like, well, who can still go? And we mentioned Lita and Trish, and we kind of got stuck. Um, and apparently they are too, because that's been the only two we've seen. Anyhow, uh, the next tag team contest was old Gender Mayhall's guys, Veer McMahon and the other guy, Squeegee, what's his name? Well, they beat Frickin' Frack. Not, I think yin, not yin and Yang. Not yin, yin and Yang, but Frickin' Frack. And I think Frick dropped the fall, but it could have been Frack. I'm not sure. So then... Again, another in-ring promo, Owens and Zane. And again, I, I have to call attention to this all the time because if they're not going to take advantage of this, they're out of their minds. They sing along with Sammy's music, the crowd chants Sammy, and Kevin stands there. And you can kind of see him sub subtly reacting to it, but the thing is, knowing how pompous a windbag he is, I'm not sure whether he's really reacting to it for a shoot and he's not supposed to or whether they're supposed to be showing that part of the story yet. But again, they get in the ring and Sammy did the talking and Owen stood there and made kind of faces, right? It looks like he's either a brilliant actor or he's really pissed because that looks like him when he doesn't like the fucking creative. So anyway, Imperium suddenly come out. But the Stooges talk and not Gunther. And I wish if Gunther, I, I mean, it's a double-edged sword. They're having Gunther come out there to give the his Stooges some more credibility or gravitas or whatever. But then he gets involved in the shit that they get into that is not going to make them look that good. And so anyway, they're talking to Owens and Zane when suddenly... Here comes Shoosh Boy and Fat Otis with Model Girl. And I wrote, good God. So they set up a tag team match out of all this with Gunther Stooges against Shoosh and Otis with Owens and Zane at color at ringside. So both of these were heel teams. And it's, you know, they actually had a six-minute match with no break. And it was this one. Imperium wins, thank God, but uh, that fucking Gable, just as soon as you hear Shoosh, you want to change the channel. I was already riding fast forward on this show, and when I got to this, I kept going. I, <laughs> no, I, want, I think it's important because I've gotten sick of Owens and Zane. I mean, mostly Owens' is comedy stuff and Zane just becoming the pacifist. They got to do something, but I'm riding fast forward, and then I see Imperium come out, and the two guys are talking, and I'm on four times speed, so that was my point. I could have stopped and Wait said, a minute. You've got four. I've only got three times, you prick. I could do one time, two time, three time, four time, and lightning. God damn you. I can do half a time, I guess. It's, it's like just a little bit quicker. One time, two times, and three times. That's all I got. Fucking Spectrum. I'm so sorry, man. Fucking assholes. I'd like to be able to fast forward AEW sometimes so much that the friction sets my TV on fire. <laughs> well, I was fast forwarding and I was on four times speed. So when I pressed play, right when Imperium was coming out, I said, okay, something's happening. Yeah. Let, me, let me rewind it and check it out. But because it was going so fast, it went Your a skid bit. mark went into Shoosh Boy. I saw Shoosh Boy, then I just hit the fast forward again. I was like, fuck yeah, this. I'm go. not watching this shit. <laughs> So I didn't see this. And quite frankly, there is almost an entire hour of this show that was skippable because that's what hit me here. What do you mean almost an entire hour? I'm fixing to get some more skippable shit. Well, it was like an hour straight where you didn't have to stop. There were a lot of commercials and nothing important and no important people. 
Well, see, I, I jot things down, so I stop it every now and then. The women's tag team title was decided in a four-way with Raquel and Shotzi versus Bailey and EO versus Cruella and Chelsea versus Ronda and Shayna. And Ronda and Shayna won. Um, Dolph Ziggler wrestled J.D. McDonough. And I know many of you are saying, who? And he's been on NXT. They brought him up. Why do they treat Dolph Ziggler this way? What an athlete. What a good-looking kid. What a, he's in great shape. His work is tremendous. He can, he can get guys over or he can call attention to himself. They've just beaten him like a fucking drum for years and years now. But J.D. McDonough announced at 190 pounds, looks 175, and he visually he's 14 years old. And he tried something within the first 30 seconds of this match that basically almost broke Dolph Ziggler's neck. He suplexed him over. I'll, I, I'm trying to explain what he did. I'm not sure what he was trying to do. But he grabbed Dolph Ziggler's hand and jerked Dolph off the mat into his grasp in like a bear hug. And before Dolph even had his feet under him, McDonough just lurched backwards like he was trying to legitimately belly-to-belly -belly Dolph over his head straight onto his fucking top of his head and break his neck. That's the only reason why you would ever do something like this. And Dolph turned in the nick of time and fell in a heap. And then he took him to the floor, McDonough did, and ran him into the desk and ran him into the stairs. And it looked like Dolph Ziggler, a former champion-level WWE athlete, was being beaten up by an overgrown middle schooler and with making mean faces. And they went to a double count-out. It was a double count-out. And then McDonough kneels on Dolph's head on the stairs, and Dolph is selling, screaming, Oh, the pain, it hurts! And there's nothing to sell. Nothing to sell, Jerry. Because he wasn't doing anything. They're going to try to sell this fucking Muppet-looking motherfucker as a psychopath? Did you see any of this? I didn't, and I now will go back and check it out because I saw him last week, and they teased something with him and Finn Balor. And I remember reading about how they booked him in NXT more than I ever saw any of it. But I hate to say it, I agree with every single thing you said about Dolph Ziggler. And that's why I keep fast forwarding because I know what's going to happen. Well, yeah, but I'm telling you, this guy and the people were sitting there playing pocket pool. Like, what the fuck are we looking at here? This fucking, you know, kid it, with making mean faces. We're supposed to treat it like it's goddamn. He's a psychic, a psychotic on the loose. This is Kane. Kane's on a rampage. Ah. So, folks, we were 10 o'clock Eastern, two hours into the program with everything I've just said. And here came Cody. Brian, last, have you ever seen an individual that looks more well-dressed in a suit and a sling than Cody Rhodes? Minus the necktie, he looked fine, yes. I'm telling not, you, not the necktie, the neck tattoo, excuse me. The neck tattoo, not the yeah. necktie. I thought you were commenting on his color, no, color no, no. Voice on his tie. Well, he likes to dress rather flamboyantly. I think it's uh, too much for me. Well, no, Barnett dressed flamboyantly. Cody is stylish. Cody gets his suits from Hong Kong. Well, he goes Barnett, every, every December. Barnett got his suits from Hung Lo. So anyway, the reason... What are you over there snickering for? The reason uh, why that... Uh, that Cody, as he explains it, aka Lonnie. Hey, come on now. Excuse, aka Gary Juster. <laughs> yeah, no, well, that, that's, that's, he, that, uh, Gary, Gary was just the cleanup man. But um, the reason that Cody, as he tells the story, did not tap out to Brock Lesnar is because he doesn't want to be that guy. And he explains, he's like, Brock, are you satisfied now? It's one and one. 
And this is an open challenge. I'll tell Brock where I'm going to be, and he can show up anytime. Because if, if he wants to have the rubber match and settle this, because, yeah, he beat me and I beat him, but he wasn't going to give up because he's not going to... Basically, I could hear Dusty in my head saying, I will not give you the damn satisfaction, Olanderson. He's not going to give Brock the satisfaction of giving up. And he his. <laughs> Here's the thing that the only thing for continuity's sake that I had a problem with this, he's rattling off all the cities he's going to be in. I'll be anywhere. You can come and show up anytime. His arm is still broken. I know he was allowed to have the big match with Brock Lesnar at, in Saudi Arabia, but is he also medically cleared to work in Wilkes-Barre? Apparently, once you're cleared, your clearance continues no matter what happens to you from that point on. Well, clearance rolls on then. But he, he did a good promo. And, he, and again, I think it's noticeable that Cody gets the chance to come out and do these promos and make his point and leave without being attacked or without being interrupted or without being counterpointed. And that doesn't happen, or at least hadn't been recent recent years all that often. And that's what a top babyface needs. You need to leave with the point in their head that you wanted them to leave with instead of all this other ha-ha. And he does that. And again, he cranked into another Dusty, just more well-spoken with more syllables in the words. But Brock was beast enough to break his arm, but not man enough to make him tap out. And if Brock Lesnar doesn't accept my challenge, he is afraid of Cody Rhodes. And I can, I can hear Dusty, and you are afraid of Dusty Road. Another Dusty. Excellent. That was a segment. Your thoughts? Great promo. Cody feels like a star, comes out there, seems like a bigger star than most people on the show. Good promo. I mean, Cody's the one thing they're doing right. Other than the fact he didn't get the title at WrestleMania, the Brock feud, if you can get past that, the Brock feud has been all right. Got to see what the third match will be. Well, what do you, what do you think the third match will be now? Well, they've already gone through um, the the first match was a match, but then the second match was a fight, but of nebulous. He didn't give up. There was particular no, stipulations. Cody never said I give up. He never tapped out. But I have a. It calls for an I quit match, or as Vince likes to say, a submission match. But it calls for an I quit match. But I can't envision Brock ever saying the words or actually tapping. So if they have something, but see, then if it's creative rather than flat out, he tapped or he said, I quit, then it's not decisive. And Cody's third, uh, the third time, the third match, Cody's win needs to be decisive. So the stipulations will have to reflect that. And at the same time, salvage Brock's aura. Does that make any sense? Makes perfect sense. It's going to be intriguing. I mean, this is what you want from wrestling. There has to be a third match. We think we know who's going to win. We don't know how they're going to get there and what they're going to do. If they could just put a whole card around that, it'd be lovely. <laughs> yes, it would. Uh, and then to finish up Raw, the Money in the Bank qualifier, the second one, was Shaky Nakamura against Bronson Reed. And I thought to myself, I even jotted down, shaky is the shits, we know that, but Bronson Reed is a young crusher Blackwell. I'm going to watch this. And I noted Bronson Reed having to do Nakamura stuff made this match kind of suck, and it was way more competitive than it should have been as I was getting into it. But I thought, well, at least, you know, they're using some kind of name to put Reed over. And then I saw the finish, and I wrote, my God, they beat Reed with this fucking guy? And that's what they did. They beat Bronson Reed with this fucking guy. He looks like a, the grandfather of a villain in a fucking Golden Harvest kung fu movie. Not even one of the fucking top heels that's going to come out and, and fight somebody. Just one of the crowd periphery players. 
Are you as mad as I am, or did you give a shit? I fast-forwarded, and I hate to say I did that, because I've always liked Nakamura, at least before he came to the main roster. And Bronson Reed is intriguing, but we saw the Cardi promo. We knew what the main event match was. Unfortunately, there's certain parts of the show that if you know the show, it's like the filler segments. And it felt like that. And I wanted to get through with this show. I was kind of ready. <laughs> well, and here we are, the main event. AJ Styles and Seth Franklin Rollins against Damian Priest and Finn Balor. And again, everybody's a fine worker. They're all professional. They're all in shape. It was a good tag team match. It's just, it's kind of like the WWE malaise of it all seems the same. It seems clean. I mean, they're taking big bumps and they're working hard, but there's no hatred. There's no grit. There's no animosity. There's movement taking place and everyone's professional. And then they... They'll give it a little twist and turn. The referee kicked Rhea and Dominic out of ringside. And then they'll have a snazzy little finish that'll, you know, get you up for a second where Priest gave AJ the razor's edge and covered him. But as he was covering him, Seth came and hit the curb stomp on Priest, who was on top of AJ, and then got the tag from AJ, who rolled over and tagged him. And then he fucking jumped in and hit it again. One, two, three. And it was over, and they celebrate. So again, you have one show that's nonstop mayhem and carnage and nonsensicalness. The work doesn't look good or professional. The show doesn't really make any sense. It's way past overly gimmicked. And then you come over here, and they'll talk you to death. Everybody gets the ring is mostly professional, except for the, the greenhorns they bring up every so often. And they'll give you a match or two with some moves, and then that's over. And it's almost the, the opposite. It's like it's, it, this is something to put on when you want to go to sleep and have background action going on. Instead of the cooking channel, put this on. It's the same amount of bumps, practically. Yep, I can't disagree. I mean, you know, I said before how they begin so many shows with the Judgment Day. It's always setting up this at the end. A match with these guys, and they're good. I really like Damian Priest a lot. Yeah. But for whatever reason, despite the fact that I like him a lot, despite the fact I can acknowledge that Finn Bauer will be good in the match, I wasn't... Nothing pulled me into it. It was just... You know, I know you need to do show-long stuff on top of just the weeks-long things and the month-long things. But you also have to make it compelling and people want to see it. It's just you set it up the same way every week, and then you get a variation of the same kind of match every week for the main but event. But everybody's so timid. And even the people that come out and try to talk mean are timid about it. And they're saying things that people have told them to say, or they're telling a story that's been manufactured for no good reason otherwise than to get into the match that we got to have at the you know end of the program because we were going to try to keep people for ratings it's all being just done and put out there there's no you believed that steve austin was trying to fucking find people and beat the fuck out of them or you believed that when some fucking badass of years ago got in the ring and started tearing into somebody that they were fighting for their fucking life. There was some emotion to it. There was some, the promos, they didn't just stand there and talk to each other with nobody even in the middle. It's like if you're, if you're feeling froggy jump, there ain't nothing in between us but air and opportunity. Why do we have to do this 10 minutes of smart aleck prepared material? It, it, it's just, it's a show. It's a performance. They've lost the ability to fucking hook people into what they're doing as real people or as workers because of the way that the whole thing's presented. In AEW, they're hooking some people in, <laughs> but it doesn't make any sense and it never goes anywhere. And as I... <sighs> <clears throat> But there you have it. That was Raw. It certainly was. It certainly was, and perhaps something happens to you, Raw, and you want to sue. 
That was an awful trip. Perhaps you're a lawyer and you hate the transition and you want to sue us. Wait a minute. Hold on. <laughs> if something happens to you raw and you want to sue and the, the test comes back positive, ladies and gentlemen, I know exactly who you can call. Call Stephen P. Show or two. Yes, folks, in today's world, in today's environment, you've got to be legally protected. You never know when somebody that you've done business with for years will just up and try to fuck you around. Or you never know when somebody will go in raw against your previous instructions. And I'll tell you what, there is nobody in the United States of America today that will wrap you up in a full-body condom of legal protection like this man. Stephen P. New at newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084. He is the man with the plan, or the plan B. He's always got a backup plan. You never know, but one way or another, Stephen P. New will keep you legally protected and prevent you from procreating further problems in jurisprudence, because he'll settle these matters. He'll nip it, nip it in the bud. So right there you go, folks, without any hesitation or fear of second-guessing yourself, immediately dial 888-692-8084. If you don't have a dial phone, then you can press the buttons. Or just log on, as they say, to newlawoffice.com and get all the information about how Stephen P. New can protect you from the ravages of legally transmitted diseases. That's right. <laughs> Stephen Peter, sorry, I was distracted. Has anybody checked your reflexes lately? Have they hit you on that with the little rubber hammer on any of the points of your bones? Not recently, no. 